All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's joining us online as we continue our study through Torah. And we will be reading today from Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, verse 1. Before we do, we're going to recite the blessing before reading the Torah. Baruch et Adonai amevorach. Baruch Adonai amevorach leolam vayed. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher b'kar banu mikol ha'amim. Venetan lanu etorato. Baruch atah Adonai. No ten hatorah. Amen. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Please remain standing for the Hebrew reading. It's only going to be two verses here. And it says in the Hebrew, Vachaya ki Vahaya ki tavo el haaretz asher Adonai elochecha noten lecha nachala verish verishta veashavta ba velachakta mereshit kol perecha adama asher tavi mearzecha Asher Adonai Elohecha, noten lach, vesamta vetane, vechalakta el hamakom, asher yivchar Adonai Elohecha, leshachen shmo sham. And now the closing blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Vechai olam neta betochenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten haTorah Amen Blessed are you Adonai our God, King of the universe You have given us the Torah of truth And planted within us everlasting life Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Starting in Deuteronomy 26, verse 1. Offerings of first fruits and tithes. When you have come to the land, Adonai, your God, is giving you as your inheritance, taken possession of it and settled there, you are to take the first fruits of all the crops the ground yields, which you will harvest from your land that Adonai your God is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. You will approach the Kohen holding office at the time and say to him, Today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it down in front of the altar of Adonai your God. Then in the presence of Adonai your God, you are to say, my ancestor was a nomad from Aram. He went down into Egypt, few in number and stayed. There he became a great strong populous nation. But the Egyptians treated us badly. They oppressed us and imposed harsh slavery on us. So we cried out to Adonai, the God of our ancestors. Adonai heard us, saw our misery, toil, and oppression. And Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and a stretched out arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. Now he has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, Therefore, as you see, I have now brought the first fruits of the land which you, Adonai, have given me. 
You are then to put the basket down before Adonai your God, prostrate yourself before Adonai your God, and take joy in all the good that Adonai your God has given you, your household, the levy, and the foreigner living with you, after you have separated a tenth of the crops yielded in the third year, the year of separating a tenth, and have given it to the levy, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, so that they can have enough food to satisfy them while staying with you. You are to say in the presence of Adonai your God, I have rid my house of the things set aside for God and given them to the levy, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow in keeping with every one of the mitzvot you gave me. I haven't disobeyed any of your mitzvot or forgotten them. I haven't eaten any of this food when mourning. I haven't put any of it aside when unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. I have listened to what Adonai my God has said, and I have done everything you ordered me to do. Look out from your holy dwelling place from heaven and bless your people, Israel, and the land you gave us, as you swore to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. Today, Adonai your God orders you to obey these laws and rulings. Therefore, you are to observe and obey them with all your heart and with all your being. You are agreeing today that Adonai is your God and that you will follow his ways, observe his laws, mitzvot, and rulings, and do what he says. In turn, Adonai is agreeing today that you are his own unique treasure, as he promised you that you are to observe all his mitzvot and that he will raise you high above all the nations he has made in praise, reputation, and glory, and that he has said you will be a holy people before Adonai your God. So we made it all the way to Ki Yavo. Torah portion number 50. Fifty of fifty-four. We're getting down to the very end here. Kiavo means when you come in, uh, referring to when you come into the land. The first word in the, or the first in the first sentence in the portion. Last week's portion, Kitetse, when you go out, referring to when you were to go out of the desert. Uh, we discuss Moshe's message to the people as he rolled out 74 mitzvot in one portion. So there's a lot going on, a lot of new commands that they were given just before they were to enter into the land. And we talked about the woman captured in war, the captivating woman, and all of the mitzvot mitzvot concerning her. So that brings us here to Ki Tavo. Starts here in verse 26.1. Most of your Bibles will say offerings of first fruit and tithes, something to that effect. And we want to discuss this. Sometimes um, words can have entered into, uh, um, into Christianity, even Messianic Judaism to a certain degree, that have been the translation's not good. And because the translation's not good, then the teaching is it's not good. If the foundation isn't good, the building's not going to be good. So let's start with 26.1. When you have come to the land, Kiyavo, Adonai your God is giving you as your inheritance. Take possession of it and settle there. You are to take the first fruits of all your crops of the ground, the ground yields, which you are to harvest from your land, and Adonai your God is giving you. Put them in a basket. And go to the place where Adonai, your God, will choose to have, you, have his name live. 
So we're going to break down some of this <clears throat> by the words. Um, as I was preparing for this, I was just reminded of something. To understand a scripture, one thing is very important. First, you need to know who is it referring to. You need to know what it's referring to, where it's referring to, when it's referring to, why it's referring to, whatever it's referring to, and how it's referring to. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. And so I want to go through these with you one at a time and see if we can come up with a picture of what's going on here. And by the time we're done, I believe there'll be some things we talk about that you hadn't heard before, we haven't talked about. They'll bring some, hopefully some different understanding. Um, all of this scripture is very specific. There are certain times we've discussed when to take a uh, scripture um, at face value or specifically or um, uh, what's the word you use, Linda? Literally. Literally, thank you. And when to take it metaphorically, allegorically, poetically. There's all these different ways. This is a scripture to take very literally and so we're going to talk about that literal understanding first because a lot of people miss it. So let's start off with the who is the scripture referring to when you have come into the land? Who's this referring to? Israelites. The Israelites, the Jewish people. Okay. So we know who. And what is it referring to? Harvest. The, the harvest, yeah, and the the... Time, the giving of that harvest. Okay, that's what it's referring to. And where is it referring to? Where is this to take place? In the land. Is it referring to Fresno, California? How about Sanger? No. Kingsburg? Of course, go. No. Referring to Fresno. And why is it referring to them? Because he gave them the land, they're about to go into it, and when they get there, they're to do a certain thing with the crops. So that's, that's the why. And how was it referring to them? Well, the how is a little different. It's referring to them by the fact that they are the who that is being talked about. They're the ones who are going to do the what, bring the offering that's talking about. They're the ones who are entering into the land to be the, the where it's to be done. They're the ones who are to do it when it is the appropriate time. And they're the ones who are the whole focus of this. And this is why they're to do it is because of their relationship with the Father and the covenants he made with them. That all sound pretty understandable. So I want to talk to you about this. Last week during the Shior, the wonderful sister who led the Shior, everyone does it a little differently. And she was giving these examples of, I am this person. Like she would say something to the effect of, I am a Gentile and I'm living, I think she said, I'm living in Georgia and I have a strawberry farm. And so what do I do concerning this? Does it apply to me? And so everyone kind of broke it down. Well, no. One, it doesn't apply to you because you're not Jewish. Two, it doesn't apply to you because, well, there's no temple or tabernacle to even bring something to. Where it doesn't apply to you because you're not in the land. When it doesn't apply to you because there is no temple, you're not in the land, you're not Jewish, and it doesn't apply to you. Why? Because you're not Jewish. Again, the whole list. And how? Same thing, whole list. So each time she brought this up, she incrementally changed a little something in the story to make everyone think. So again, does this apply to, or let me say it doesn't. It does not apply to Gentiles at all and does not apply to even Jews outside the land of Israel. 
Is that understandable there? Okay. If you do this and you're not Jewish, you're not fulfilling a mitzvah. So, for instance, if, you know, the harvest comes in and all of a sudden you bring in, you want to bring in something to give, that's all fine, but it's not fulfilling the mitzvah of this command. Um, and if you're Jewish and you were to do this outside of Israel, it still wouldn't be fulfilling the command. So this ought to make a lot of us go, <sighs> that there's so many things we can't do, we're not called to do, and we're not in the place to do it, and no one can do it right now because there's no temple. Will this happen again? Yes, it will. When? The, when? when the temple's there again, right? These are, so these are the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So any thoughts about that or questions? Yeah. I'd say that if a proselyte, even if they're Gentile, they would be doing it because they're a part of the nation there. And they um, have lands, like, for example, um, yeah. Caleb. It, so, so if they were um, a convert to Judaism and if they own land... Um, then that's different than, and in the land, and there's a temple, and at the right time, and with the, right. And so she brought up the strawberries last week, because why not strawberries? What if you're in the land and you have strawberries? Does it apply? No. Why, why not? Because it doesn't apply to strawberries. It applies to the eight fruits. It applies to the fruits of the land. So this gets very, t and I, when she first started doing it, I was like, okay, where's she going with this? And I quickly realized, oh, now I see what she's doing. So um, all of that being said, at a, another congregation in a land far, far away, in a, in a galaxy far, far away at a different time, there was a nice gentleman who came in and had some questions regarding this concerning his farm in the area. Should I do this? And... So he took these principles and started doing them. And we talked about this idea about being blessed kind of thing. Let me say it a different way. Some very uh, specific things that he was praying for that really he needed, either God was going to do it or not, he had no way of, came to pass quickly, swiftly, and almost miraculously. So then the idea is, well, okay, did he, because he did that, did that happen? I, I don't know. But really where the, the kind of the middle grounders of what we should do with these things is it's a good practice to do. That makes sense? Can we give a tithe and an offering? No. No. He, yes, no, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so what's, why can't we give a tithe and an offering today? What's the first reason? No temple. no temple. Okay. And the tithe and the offerings were always what? Food. Food. So now there were money that came in, but that was based on if you couldn't get your... So then what do we do today? Why do we quote unquote give tithes and offerings or even give? Well, because we're commemorating the tithe and the temple. So is it a good... Pre is it a command to tithe? No. Is it a good practice to tithe? Does it show that you're connected with the, um, uh, you're connected with the desire to see God's kingdom come to pass, be provided for, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. So we do, um, but it's not because we're quote unquote tithing. We're giving to see the um, the uh, plan of God for lack of a better understanding, continue. That's the reason. And the rabbis talked about something very interesting that exists in Christianity. That In Christianity, there's a lot of pulling and teaching and giving, 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 and this and that. God's going to bless. All this kind of crazy stuff. But the rabbis also, they put a limit on how much someone could actually give. So they wouldn't allow you just to come in and give, I'm going to give, I sold my house, I'm going to give all of it. No, they, they tell you don't, you don't. Why? Because you're robbing, if you do that, then you're taking away the mitzvah to be a blessing 
to your children's children. So there, everything is in balance. You know, we hear the idea of God owns everything and we're just stewards, and that's true. So we should, our lives in every way should be continually giving in every way to support what he's doing. Amen? Same idea within a marriage, you know. If you love your spouse, do you give to them? Do you, with, do you withhold anything from them? No, everything that's yours is theirs, theirs is yours, that kind of understanding. So back to the the main topic here. This is Israel. This is going on in Israel. It can't be done. So everything we do without a temple is based on doing the best we can do. I got into a little bit of a discussion with someone on Facebook who was making this, he put this comment on there to the effect of, you know, the, the Orthodox are doing X, Y, and Z, and they said that, you know, they're replacing the temple offerings and temple services with liturgy, they replaced it with that. So he went on to make some other comment, but I can't remember exactly what it was. As soon as I saw that, I said, no. The whole premise of what you're saying is off. So anything you say from here is going to be based on that, and that's not true. They didn't say they replaced it. With this idea has been replaced, you know, I'm, it's, we're, we're never going to do it again. No, they're doing the best they can do at what they have at the moment. And when I told them, I said, they also said that they're waiting on the temple. So in between now and the temple being rebuilt, what's the best we can do? That's the understanding. Not it's been replaced by anything because eventually we know Messiah will be in the throne. The temple will be up and running and everything. Yeah, go ahead. I don't remember exactly. I'm thinking it was somewhere, I want to say it was 30 or 40%, something. I don't remember exactly. But the idea was, wait a minute, don't go, you know, everything we do is supposed to be in balance. It's not some excessive, you know, yeah. Right. Also excessive. Yeah, right. And then if you go back to Abraham when he fought the battle with the kings, you know, he brought so much stuff back prior to anybody ever. It was never codified how much to give. So what does that say? I mean, you know, in your heart, you know, Scripture says to do um, to don't feel pressure to give by someone else. On the other hand, you know, in your heart. And, and this isn't just about money in a congregational thing. This is about your whole life. You know in your heart when he says, you know, you need to give, you need to take care of that. Whatever it is, giving of help, giving of food, giving of love, giving of giving, just giving of yourself to the point where you know, you really know when you're giving, when you can feel it, when it causes you to have to make a change of schedule, a change of what I wanted I'm going to quote-unquote sacrifice so that I can do this mitzvah that God has put in my heart to do that I know is right. Totally different understanding that I'm going to give this 10 bucks and God, this is my seed. I'm going to grow it and multiply into 1,000 by next week and I'm going to be in Tahiti by the weekend after that. That kind of mentality. That's just a bunch of junk. It, It hurts a lot of people and only benefits the ones who are saying it and it only benefits them temporarily in this life. In the next life, they'll have to answer for it. All the blessings, when you see the blessings and all these kind of things from mitzvot, from doing the work of God, is always, every reference scripturally is always about in the world to come. Store up your treasures in heaven. What's he talking about? He's talking about doing mitzvot and you, you, there's, you'll be blessed by it, but it's not why you do it. You do it because it's, he told you to do it because you love God. Um, but when you get to heaven, you'll be rewarded for it. And again, that's even not why we do it. Motivation matters too. We do it because we love him, because he is who he is. As we talked about during class, you know, if you're sick, is, does that mean he's not blessing you, he's not good? Then if you're healthy, he's only good to those who are healthy and those who are sick, he's not good to? No. You know, maybe you're like, you're older and you're dealing with some things 
But when you're 20 or you see somebody else is 20, 25, they're like in the prime of their life. They're not dealing with those things. Does that mean he's blessing the younger person and you're not being blessed? No. There's a whole lot more to it than that kind of... Whenever you hear somebody teaching some kind of pigeonholed doctrine that has no connection to the whole heart of God, the whole totality of Scripture, just set it aside and look into it yourself before you just swallow it hook, line, and sinker and end up finding out it's too late and you're hurt, they're running to the bank, and your life is ruined, and they can care. What, what, you did what? I don't, I don't, do I even know you? But I've seen it. <laughs> Not saying any names or situations. I've seen it many times up close and personal. So back to this. It doesn't apply to Gentiles. If you do these things, it's a good way of doing things. Um, it's a good practice. But again, we don't do it for um, the motivations of our heart. We talked about during this, this month of the law. The motive, it doesn't matter how much you come in and smile. You, God sees right to your heart. And we need to go to him transparently like we talked about Shaddai um, so that we can have that closeness with him and receive from him as our all-sufficient one and the protection from him. This week's Torah portion... It begins with a description of the Bikurim or the first fruits offering. According to Leviticus 23.17, the Bik, and I want, write that down, Leviticus 23.17, just as a reference, you can go back in your own time and look into it. The Bikurim offering begins every year when? Anybody have an idea when it begins? Because this is really important. Because, what's that? Uh, you know, that's, I'm not sure about that. Only because, well, it, be, it specifically begins on Shavuot. And I'm not sure if that's connected to that or not. Um, I have to look into that. But it's, it's connected to Shavuot, okay? The Bikarim or first fruits are placed in a basket and brought to the temple to the Kohen on duty. In the third, which week is our... Perky of our um, temple offerings, fourth week. So next week, we have temple offerings and liturgy. We're going to do something next week. But the fourth week of October, we should have everyone back who's been out of town. And I want to wait until... Will you be back then? Yes. Oh, you'll be back then too. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I try to do things when we have most of the people. Every, too many people out right now. But we're going to... We had the pleasure, Stacy and I, this week of taking a tour of the temple with Rabbi Bernstein and there's about 60 of us. And, you know, the, uh, you know, just pictures and this is this and this or that happened and everyone was asking questions and jumping in. I ended up with like 10 pages of notes in an hour, hour and a half. Stacy's got a ton of notes. It was like, whoa. So we're going to take a tour of the temple together on that date. So mark your calendars the third, third, fourth week, fourth, fourth Shabbat of October during our Messianic Roundtable time. Yep. So it's going to be, I'm really looking forward to it because it was, it had me grinning and like, wow, this is awesome. I wish I could say it today, but I can't. So we'll talk about it then. So fourth? No, I the, that's the, 23rd. the fourth Shabbat of October. Yeah, that's the, uh, the fourth Shabbat. Is it 22nd? 22nd. Oh, you won't be back. Uh, okay, well. We'll have, I'll have you the little diagram, and maybe you can look at someone's notes and ask questions, and we'll... Um, but I definitely want to get that into the minds of everyone here to have an idea, and we're talking about these things, what, it's, what some of these things are. So, the bikurim or first fruits are placed in a basket and brought to the temple to the Kohen on duty. And that brings us to Deuteronomy 26.3. You will approach the Kohen holding office at the time and say to him, today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from you and put it down in front of the altar of Adonai your God. We'll talk about the specific gate that this goes through and show you a little diagram of where this stuff happens. Then the offer recites verses from Deuteronomy 26. 
that we're reading today. Okay? That recap the history of the children of Israel before coming into the land of promise. And here's what it says about that. Verse 5, Then in the presence of Adonai, your God, you are to say, again, they're at the temple. They're inside the gates of the temple. They've just handed their basket or baskets of first fruits to the Kohen on duty. He's doing what he is supposed to do with them. And you, then they say, again, in the presence of Adonai, your God, you are to say these things. Stand before God and speak. You remember on the Wizard of Oz? I miss this kind of negative and scary, but he gets up and he says, I am the great and powerful Oz. Who are you? And they're just scared. And they're dealing with the real God of the universe standing before him. Come before him in his presence and say these things. My ancestor was, was a nomad from Aram. He went down to Egypt. Few in number and stayed there. He became great and strong, a populous nation. But the Egyptians, they treated us so badly. They oppressed us. They imprisoned us harshly, slavery, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on with this long list of things that is to be spoken in the presence of God after giving the... Skipping down to, skipping to verse, verse 13, You are to say in the presence of Adonai, your God, I have ridden my house of the things set aside... For God have given them to the Levi. You've got to testify. I'm not lying, God. I haven't held back what you've told me to bring. Give it to the priests. Nothing else hidden at home. Total transparency. Verse 14, I haven't eaten any of this food when morning. I haven't put any of it aside when unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. The whole idea was the first fruits was the best. It wasn't just a percentage. It wasn't just a portion. It was the best portion. The best. You know, you've heard growing up, your parents would tell you, oh, I don't know what I can do. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm in a race or something. I don't know how I'm going to do it. What would they tell you? Give it your best. This is how God has called his people. Give your best. Don't come into the temple with some lame goat, some bruised fruit, some sour grapes. And this sounds like, of course not, but in the church world, Church folks were notorious about doing this kind of stuff. You know, oh, I'm coming to give the Lord something today. I've got a great gift for the Lord today. It's in the parking lot. Oh, you mean that car that's out there smoking and dripping oil and the, the tires are falling off? Yes, what a great blessing I am giving to the Lord. Maybe God doesn't want, these, doesn't want that kind of blessing. What about the nice, new, shiny, you know, uh, Mercedes that you bought? with the money that Adonai told you to give before. I'm just saying, that, but these are, these, are the, these are the heart conditions of men that if you don't watch it, you find yourself in it, then you come during a lull, you come to Yom Kippur, and you'll say, ah, uh, uh, and you want to hide something. And he even says in verse, let's see, in verse 13 again, I have rid my house of the things set aside, set aside for God. It wasn't just, oh, I'm like just, here's a piece of fruit for, here you go, God. No, it was set aside for him intentionally. It was handled right. It wasn't handled with unclean hands. It wasn't, uh, what else does he mention here? I haven't put any of it aside when I've been unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. I have listened to what I my God has said, and I have done everything you order me to do. You better say that right when you say it, and it better be true. You imagine me in the temple. There's the priest. You brought the offering, and you say, I have given, I have listened to what you told me to do, God, and I've done everything you ordered me to do. And knowing in your heart that you have it, 
I mean, these things aren't to be during a chag, during a chag, during a holy day, an appointed time to do a certain thing. Look out from your, verse fifteen. Look out from your holy dwelling place from heaven and bless your people Israel. And the land you gave us, as you swore to our ancestors. They're bringing their personal fruit from their personal vineyard, and they're saying, bless your people, bless Israel, bless us all with, I'm bringing mine, bless us all. Not, and bless me, the land you gave me, and you swore to me, no, he's saying, bless us. You swore to my, our, our ancestors, and you gave us the land. Totally different mentality of giving so I can be blessed. Totally different idea and understanding. Verse 16, today Adonai, your God orders you to obey these laws and rulings. Therefore, you are to observe and obey them with half of your heart. Half-heartedly, whatever, with all of your heart and all of your being. All your, so this idea comes up a lot in Scripture. It's saying to obey Him with all of your being and all of your stuff. Everything He calls to be in line with worshiping Him. Verse 17, you are agreeing today that Adonai is your God and that you will follow his ways, observe his laws, mitzvot and rulings, and do whatever he says. In turn, Adonai is agreeing today that you are his own unique treasure, and he has promised you that you are to observe all his mitzvot. Do what he says, you'll get blessed. Don't do what he says, you'll be cursed. You don't have to worry about some little witch doctor somewhere or someone poking a pin in a voodoo doll. That's not the curse. You, he's not, he, bless him or do what he said to do. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Turn away from him. You got to worry about that kind of thing. You open doors for that. Verse 19, and that he will raise you high above all the nations as he has made in praise, reputation, and glory, and that, as he said, you will be a holy people for Adonai, your God. People read this today in the Christian world in particular, or even in the secular world. And they say, you will be a holy people, Fred, and not your God. And they immediately think righteous. Don't say they'll be a righteous people. It says they'll be a holy people. And it doesn't say they'll be a holy people by their own um, being set apart. It said they'll be a holy people because God chose them and God, he set them apart. When you focus on the promises of God, things look different than when you focus on the disobedience of man. Totally different idea, totally different understanding. So this recitation ends the first fruits bickering are given to the uh, Kohen for his consumption. So the Kohen gets to eat this fruit that you've given, the Kohen neem. Once the offerer has presented the bikkurim offering, his crops, what happens to his crops? What happens to the state of his crops? He can now eat them. So you have this large farm and you want to go, I'm just going to eat. Look, there's the first, look, the first ones. I'm, no one's going to see. I'm going to go ahead and eat it. Doesn't belong to you, belongs to God. And there's an understanding in, Jew, in Judaism that says anything that comes that grows from the ground is, is, grows because God caused it to grow. Um, so now you can freely go home and eat your crops. And when all your neighbors see you eating of your crops, guess what they know and expect? What did you do? You brought in the first fruits. Nothing is allowed to be consumed before the Bikarim offering. So it's very interesting about this. It wasn't a, a situation of one person bringing in their fruits. The whole town or the whole village would start at like midnight. 
they would decorate wagons and decorate things, and you'd have like a whole parade as you march together as a community to Jerusalem to present. There was a great processional. There was instruments and music and singing, and it was basically a party, a holy party. You can imagine the Temple Mount just filled with singing and celebration coming from all directions, culminating at the temple, at the Nicanor Gate, where the people would bring in. And this went on 24-6 during this time. Imagine that. Hundreds of thousands of people descending in this short amount of time. Again, nothing is to be consumed before the bickering offering. So that brings us to the last thing I want to talk about. There's a great misconception about first fruits occurring during Pesach. And you hear this idea that Yeshua is the first fruits. Anybody ever heard that? How was he the first fruits? First risen from the dead of many brethren. Um, and that's true, but he's not the first fruits. He's, we, we've got to be careful when we're looking at scriptures to see if it says someone is, or if it says someone is as, or someone is like. He's like the first fruits. And I'll get into this more in Pesach because I don't have time to get into it today. He's like the first fruits but he's not the first fruits. The omer or the sheaf offering is brought from the second day of matzah until Shavuot. This is not bikarim. This isn't first fruits. This is the omer. Um, this offering is very different from the bikarim offering. The sheaf offering, a sheaf offering of grain, one for the entire, oh, it's for, for the entire nation of Israel. So can you say Yeshua was like, he wasn't offering for the entire nation of Israel. And you can see he was like he was lifted up um, and he was waved. But you'll notice this concerning the Omer offering. There's no basket. There's no reciting of, um, I'm sorry, there's the first fruits offering. There's no basket. There's no reciting of Deuteronomy 26. I'm sorry, let me say this right. The Omer offering. I had it right the first time. There's no basket. There's no reciting of Deuteronomy 26. It's a grain offering. And not any other fruit is involved. It's a very different offering. The bickering offering came from every farm and field close enough to Jerusalem that the fruits would not spoil during the trip. That's what made it a bickering offering. Every village brought their bickering to the temple together. We keep coming across this together, 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 even the com a small community. Parades from farming towns all over Israel would arrive in Jerusalem with music, drums, and dancing. The bickering one was one of the most joyous offerings in the temple. We think about these appointed days in the celebration that you were, they were celebrating that they could actually, they were celebrating the work they had done so that they could come in and give. They weren't celebrating, we didn't do anything, we've got faith and God is going to bless us and give us a bunch of stuff we didn't work for. Totally opposite idea. All of that being said, as a principle, whenever we give anything at a night, we should remind ourselves to be joyful about it. Every scripture says God loves a what kind of giver? Joyful. This is the picture of that. This is the picture of those who were coming. God bless you. They were coming to give with joy and happy to do it. Hallelujah. Anybody have any thoughts or questions before we finish up? You, you mentioned the bickering offering. Yeah. And we're reading about the bickering offering, right? We're reading about the, um, the first fruits offering. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, the bickering, yes, yes, the bickering, the first fruits offering, yes. Yes, and this is Shavuot. First fruits, bickering offering, Shavuot, all the same thing, three days. 
the, let me get this right here before I, I want to tell you exactly. Well, bikram is first fruits. Sh- b- bikram is fruits. Shavuot is grain, is the grain offering. The Shavuot offering starts between Shavuot and goes through, um, goes through Sukkot. Well, it's right here. So this is where it gets tricky, to say the least. Because in the, in the English translations, it uses first fruits. And sometimes it's talking about the Omer, and sometimes it's talking about first fruits. And you have to, the only way to, to see is you have to look it up in particular in Aramaic. But even in the Greek, it's better. It actually separates the two. In the Aramaic, it shows you um, which one is talking about the Omer or the um, or the Bikarim offering, and that's only t- referring to Pesach, when there's this idea that Yeshua rose on first fruits, um, which the math doesn't add up, and it's not what it says. It says you see the scriptures that say he rose on the third day, and it says he rose. Um, after the third day. So how can it be both? So the idea is that on the um, Yeshua was crucified the same time on Nisan 14 when they were cru- or when they were slaughtering the animals. And yeah. Oh the yeah right well. Mm-hmm. This is first fruits. Yeah, this is with the, the fruits. But when was that? I mean, like... um, this is, give me one quick second because I want to make sure I answer you right. So, okay, Shavuot was the, this happened after, Okay, this is where it gets tricky because they're connected. You have the, on first fruits or on the, um, the, what's the best way to explain this to you here? You can go ahead and turn this off. Shabbat shalom, everyone. We'll see you next week. So this right here is talking about, it's talking about first fruits, fruits in a basket.